Today, uh, actually, I will try to connect uh, the uh, global uh, economic and financial outlook with some of the challenges and opportunities uh, in the uh, long-term investing uh, community, and starting with uh, some of the key points uh, actually uh, shaping, in my view, the um, economic and uh, portfolio uh, landscapes uh, at the moment. Generally uh, speaking, I would uh, mention three uh, of the start uh, We are in a, from a micro standpoint, we are in a sluggish, uh, fragile, erratically disynchronized uh, macro uh, environment today. Two, uh, on the financial market side, we are in a sweet spot. Just enjoy it due to the uh, support from central banks, uh, specifically in the West. We are all on steroids, and this uh, will stay with us uh, moving uh, moving forward, providing opportunities and the risky assets, uh, but also uh, basically bringing some risks. The biggest risk being for investors today, uh, due to the due to the tightness of some of the risk premia, is basically to end up uh, capturing risk premia on hidden fat days and the future uh, bursting bubbles. Three, uh, there is an ima amazing imbalance at the world level between uh, the um, impressive amounts of savings, reserves, uh, money creation, uh, not only savings, but uh, amazing imbalance between this pool of money, uh, uh, often part in low yielding or non productive uh, assets, and on the other hand, the uh, demand for projects to be uh, financed across the world. Um, obviously in the emerging economies, but also in the developed world and whatever the format, including infrastructure and, uh, and other uh, underlying um, investment uh, instruments. One, on the macro side, uh, the piece of good news I bring in to you from Europe is that the uh, recession is behind us and that we are moving uh, upward, uh, actually uh, on a second directive basis, moving from minus zero something to plus zero something, it makes a difference. And this is, uh, this is my first point. The second one, and this is an, uh, it's, it's an important one actually, with this uh, debt ceiling thing uh, in the US something has changed. Something has changed. Not that the US economy will default, but actually uh, the fear of, uh, let's say, technical default has increased, which means from an investment standpoint that there is now a risk tail attached to a so-called risk-free asset. Meaning that investors will, and that's already started, will have to incorporate this risk tail in their strategies. The US economy is for sure flexible on a recovery path. There is no problem on that, on that side. But we know, and this is new, there is a problem in terms of, I would say, deficit governance. And we know that the problem is not over. It will come back, come back uh, uh, next year, for sure. And we know, uh, we know already the date. Meaning that uh, there is room, actually, uh, to diversify. Uh, across the globe on a risk specific basis, across developed uh, assets, but also including emerging uh, market related assets out of the uh, impressive uh, positions built into uh, so called risk free US dollar denominated assets. And this is, a, this is a big message, and specifically, this uh, paved the ground for reconsidering uh, European assets. You are all, we've been seeing uh, rising demand uh, for uh, European assets. They are in demand from an absolute standpoint because they are offer value in uh, some areas, including European equities, and on a relative basis, starting from very underweight uh, position, uh, there is a case to be made in favor of European assets, and specifically European equities. Growth is on the hub. Profits are expected uh, in the plus 10 to plus 12 percent area uh, next year. Dividend yield is a plus. Really, there is room for the re-rating of fees across uh, European equities uh, market. Uh, the M&A cycle is uh, is back into uh, into the landscape, and uh, the ECB 
uh, is expected to do uh, more, not less, in terms of uh, accommodative uh, stance. Second topic is the, uh, MR on the emerging side. The good thing about the sphere of uh, tapering, actually, is the fact that uh, it made uh, investors aware, at last, that there is no such thing like a unique emerging, uh, emerging economies or emerging market universal peace, actually. It forced investors, at last, to uh, discriminate, again, across the emerging economies and markets, basically making differences between the way some economies are financed, including direct investment versus uh, other flows, uh, structural outgrowth, exposure to the commodity cycle, overvaluation or undervaluation of the currency, uh, appropriate or not appropriate uh, policy uh, and FX uh, management. So the uh, culprits have already been uh, identified, but this process is not yet over. Uh, don't throw uh, the baby with the uh, bath water. Uh, the uh, emerging economy story is, is here to stay and will stay. The fundamentals are strong, but discrimination is uh, warranted uh, on a risk specific basis. Uh, two, at the portfolio uh, level, uh, in the investment community, there are st some structural shifts in the uh, low yielding environment today. Uh, one is the fact that compared with the last 30 years, uh, at least three pieces have changed. One is uh, the lack of predictability and visibility on growth and inflation, compared with the, uh, on average, the last 30 years. Two is the central banking model in the West, actually. There are, we are in a transition, in my view, uh, towards a new, uh, a new model, as often theory comes after uh, practice. Uh, what is, uh, you know, non-conventional that last uh, becomes conventional. And my, uh, my conviction is that we are facing not an exceptional phase, but basically a change in the DNA of uh, central banking uh, approach uh, to monetary policy in the, in the West. Um, this is the second aspect, and there is a paradox of credibility today. We all count on central banks, the planet counts on central banks to do the trick at a moment when they are, to a large extent, uh, lost in transition, finding their way uh, out of uh, non-conventional policies. Uh, three is the equilibrium levels of uh, many uh, asset classes. Difficult to assess, you know, a long-term investor is always a value investor playing some kind of a mean regression to an equilibrium level. But some of the equilibrium levels have been distorted by monetary policies, uh, obviously. Uh, it's difficult to assess the value of an equity market taking a close to zero uh, bond yield. So uh, this is part or to take an example, what is the equilibrium level of uh, spreads uh, uh, within the Eurozone, uh, Italy versus uh, Spain, etc. Based on history, we are basically, we've got no reference uh, point. Two, uh, actually, the uh, equation seen from the investor community is basically interest rates to stay low, search for yield, capital preservation uh, as an objective, negative real, real returns as a risk, Clearly. And this is a, this is a new uh, trend, uh, asymmetrical uh, approach to gains and losses. More and more investors are willing to give up part of the gains, assuming uh, that they help, uh, they help reducing uh, losses, actually. And this uh, opens the door for uh, new investment strategies, more asymmetrically uh, oriented. Three, actually, uh, in terms of investment strategy, the global shift from national or regional to global strategies, from uh, benchmark to total return and absolute return, and what we call smart return, you know, those uh, mid variance, uh, maximum diversification out of the uh, classic uh, benchmarks, a move from uh, investment ratio, uh, information ratio to sharp ratio, from relative risk to total risk, and from products to outcome-driven solutions. This is the general, uh, there are the general shifts 
uh, we are seeing. Two, uh, diversification and allocation, actually. Uh, diversification is not that. The question is, what should we diversify? And there is a trend towards the classic asset allocation, equities versus bonds versus the rest, uh, which is a very uh, simplistic way to diversify, uh, to uh, factor allocation, size, momentum, style, uh, <coughs> risk allocation, and macro factor allocation. You can split your portfolio into macro factors, growth, inflation, for example, and uh, gives you a different way to uh, assemble uh, the various uh, pieces. Second big theme, actually, is the, uh, the status of governmental bonds in a portfolio. Technically speaking, the efficient frontier of governmental bonds, Western bonds, has changed. Their utility function has changed. We've spent basically 30 years trading equities versus governmental bonds in a very comfortable uh, position, actually. Because we knew that those, those uh, governmental bonds were providing a cushion versus the exposure to risky assets. And this has started to change with the euro debt crisis. There are now uh, doubts about uh, in the US. Uh, and this, this makes a change. What should be the role of governmental bonds in a, in a portfolio uh, today? Uh, specifically, when they are heavily concentrated in the uh, US uh, space. And then back to my previous point about this uh, debt ceiling uh, thing. Uh, then, three, uh, a rising trend actually towards risk management drawdown management and uh, the management of benchmark traps. You know, the classic market cap weighted benchmark is flawed with, uh, and it's consensual now. It's full of biases in terms of risks, sectors, etc. And this opens the door and, is, and, and those benchmarks are poor cyclical. You end up buying what is uh, basically rising. Uh, so there is a strong move across the investment community to move out of those benchmarks, trying to, uh, to uh, find you different uh, approaches, smart beta, risk variety, mean variance, maximum diversification. There are many ways. Just mention the, uh, the trend. Um, another trend is basically clarifying within the institutions, long-term institutions specifically, the alpha beta policy. There is confusion uh, across uh, the community uh, on the uh, definition of territories for alpha, definition of territories for beta, time framework, alignment of the governance from the front office to the board in order to, uh, to make sure that the, uh, the policy is shared uh, in order to be uh, efficient. What should I, what, what should I manage uh, actively, passively? And within passive, smart beta versus classic mark weighted indices. This is uh, an area uh, of, uh, of focus. Last uh, third point, I will come back to this uh, later in the presentation. Long term investors bridging the funding gap, already mentioned the gap. Uh, there are um, uh, many ways to bridge the, the gap, and there are many initiatives, very diverse since the, this community is diverse, actually. Uh, and the question is how to leverage on the specificities of uh, long-term investors, what they are today, in order to help uh, better channeling the pool of savings and reserves where they are into the uh, profitable projects where they are. Now, We will go rapidly uh, through a uh, couple of slides. So, this one is basically showing uh, the uh, balance sheet of uh, the, the biggest central banks. The message is very uh, simple, uh, and this is my conviction. Uh, balance sheet expansion is to stay with us, for sure, in Japan and in Europe. We will see more, not less. And even in the US, 
my conviction is that uh, don't expect the balance sheet of the, uh, the Fed to, uh, to contract uh, very rapidly. Actually, next year, even taking into consideration some tapering, the balance sheet will continue to expand at a slower pace, but will continue to uh, expand. Growth showing uh, GDP in volume today. Um, we are heading towards a decent 3.5 something uh, at the global level today. Uh, still sluggish in Europe. Uh, some kind of a decentralization because emerging economies next year will start will stop accelerating. Not necessarily moving <coughs> but no acceleration and even uh, a slowdown uh, as, a, as a theme. Uh, Yes, US, UK uh, enjoying a recovery, but still fragile. Uh, very much dependent on what's going on in the uh, housing-related uh, part of the uh, economy, and therefore to the monetary policy. Japan, the jury is still, hope is still on hold. We've seen an uh, aggressive action. Uh, we've got to see uh, the consequences, specifically on the investment side, still to be seen. It's not yet the case uh, today. U.S. Uh, clearly, uh, the economy is doing better. The consumer is doing better. Uh, households uh, and corporates have uh, nearly completed the deleveraging uh, process, and the uh, housing market is uh, uh, at last uh, coming out of uh, the woods. Uh, in terms of um, excess of liquidity, uh, I didn't share in June. I have not changed my mind. Uh, I think that the fears of normalization, generally speaking, are overdone, actually. Uh, I don't buy the theme of normalization of monetary policies. Normalization means that we would be back to what we've uh, uh, experienced in the past. I think uh, the, the environment has uh, profoundly changed. And when monetary policy uh, are a, searching their way towards a, a new model, uh, and they uh, will remain accommodative, specifically in the US, the recovery is fragile. Uh, employment is still weak, no wages uh, in, the, in the pipe, uh, and uh, relying a lot uh, on the, uh, I would say, QE steroids channeled through the MBS channel to the housing market and uh, at the end on the uh, US uh, consumer. Uh, if, you, uh, if you remove the plug, uh, you are running an asymmetrical uh, risk at this point in the cycle. And I don't expect the Fed to, uh, to take this uh, asymmetrical, uh, asymmetrical uh, risk. So uh, excess of liquidity will stay with us. Japan, doing better, but uh, more precisely, its prospects are better. It's a matter of uh, expectations at this point in time given the uh, action of uh, uh, Abenomics, we've got to see it uh, translated into uh, reality, specifically on the uh, investment uh, cycle. Investment is still stagnating. Consumption is speaking somewhat. Uh, there are uh, big, uh, I would say, um, uh, threats around. Um, uh, they are still uh, with us, uh, public debt and deficits. They are out of control and the savings rate has collapsed, uh, actually, uh, in, in Japan. In that kind of environment, you should expect the Bank of Japan to continue to, uh, to, um, to expand uh, their balance sheet uh, and their quantitative easing uh, policy. The question of the uh, transmission mechanism uh, matters uh, quite a lot, uh, actually. It's different from the US, different from, uh, from, uh, from Japan. This chart tries to uh, elaborate on the, uh, I would say, make transmission mechanism in Japan throughout the equity uh, market. Uh, so we are in a, I would say, we are clearly in uncharted territories and uh, in an experimental, experimental uh, phase. So the trial is it, still out, but things are uh, improved. Uh, regarding the debt constraints, uh, this is part of the Japanese equation. Uh, there are various scenarios, I've listed five 
on that uh, that uh, on the on the slide, they are all suboptimal. Uh, actually, meaning that the authorities are faced with little room for mistake <laughs> due to the uh, public debt uh, over eurozone. Uh, financial stress has decreased uh, clearly. Uh, financial stress has decreased. Uh, still, uh, at the time when economic conditions did not improve <coughs> dramatically. And at a time when uh, some of the big institutional problems are still on the table, the biggest of which, and this is a milestone, uh, and uh, it's it basically linked with the banking union, actually. My view, uh, generally speaking on Europe, is that we are enjoying a cyclical recovery, modest, but we are enjoying a modest uh, cyclical recovery. The systemic risk, thanks to the ECB, is behind us. Uh, we are still faced with uh, bond markets or markets fragmentation, meaning that one of the critical points now is to cut the link between the sovereign risk and the banking risk at the uh, country levels, and this is why banking union is critical, and this is uh, to a large extent a political uh, issue. Uh, taking a medium-term view, we are still left with uh, competitive enough issues, but things have started to uh, change in Spain, for example an impressive restoration of uh, competitiveness in the recent uh, period. Uh, and basically, generally speaking, trying to, uh, to, um, to fix the uh, triangle, including competitiveness, debt dynamics, and social unrest or social consideration. Uh, it's difficult to fix the three at the same time. You need growth. But you need to restore competitiveness, you need to address that bad debt dynamics, and all in all, making sure that uh, there is no social unrest across, uh, across the board. That is the general equation of uh, authorities uh, across uh, the, uh, the Eurozone. And last but not least, uh, political leadership has got to make a, a difference now. Because in the last three years, the leadership has been transferred de facto to the ECB. They did the trick. Now we need uh, politi political leadership, basically, to move the, Euro the Eurozone seems one step further. The Eurozone, uh, as seen on this slide, is still highly fragmented between core and non-core. Uh, you can see the uh, real GDP growth. Uh, it's uh, desynchronized, and the, the gaps have uh, widened uh, across, uh, across the uh, zone. The um, France is still well behind Germany. Uh, recession more severe in Italy than in Spain, uh, and acceleration in the uh, UK, uh, driven by uh, the uh, real estate uh, component uh, of growth, not only but uh, to a large extent. Private uh, demand uh, is still negative in the peripheral countries. This is what those uh, two slides uh, are showing basically household consumption left hand and private investment uh, right hand side of the uh, of the of the slides. Uh, just look at the gap between uh, Germany and uh, Highland or Portugal, and you will uh, will uh, materialize the um, the gap to be closed. Uh, in terms of export, uh, actually. Um, Basically, the, the good news is that Spanish, for example, exports, due to a severe action on competitiveness factors, have basically gone through the roof. This, has, this is not the end of the story because uh, exports just account for 15% uh, uh, and less than 15% of uh, total GDP structure of Spain. So Spain cannot change uh, their GDP structure uh, very rapidly will take time. But there are signs of, uh, of uh, improvement. You are seeing that uh, Italy and France are struggling on the export side uh, due to uh, competitiveness uh, challenges uh, and there are structural moving forward. Unit labor cost and productivity. Uh, again, uh, see that Germany and France uh, are not that far from each other, actually.
actually. Uh, good news is pay. Uh, an amazing uh, recovery in terms of uh, productivity per hour worked. Uh, real labor productivity per hour worked. Uh, so it's uh, probably less uh, bad than many people think across Europe. Part of the problem is the fact that total hours worked could be, uh, could be improved, uh, actually. Uh, this is one of the difference between France and Germany. Productivity per head, per hour, uh, is comparable. But total hours worked uh, different from, uh, between France and Germany. And credit, and this is another uh, feature of the Eurozone. We've seen contraction of, of uh, credit uh, distribution across uh, the, uh, the Eurozone. In red, <coughs> contraction. In, in green, uh, expansion. You are seeing uh, that the general theme across uh, the Eurozone is to an extent due to the, uh, to, 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 uh, to the, the banks, but uh, generally speaking, it's, it's due to the fact that households uh, specifically uh, have stopped uh, actually uh, um, asking for, for credit and entered a sort of a deleveraging process uh, at the private sector. Uh, level of the uh, economy. Uh, SMEs, uh, <coughs> uh, the message here is that it's one example of discrepancy in the Eurozone. Uh, SME in Spain, uh, their cost of financing is 7% today, compared with uh, roughly 3% uh, in, uh, in Germany. So, transmission of the policy towards SMEs across the Eurozone is a big challenge. In the ancient times, uh, before the crisis, this, we had the same cost of finance. <coughs> Big corporates are okay, they are financing themselves in the markets, etc. But SMEs are specifically uh, a challenge for the uh, monetary policy in terms of uh, transmission policy mechanism. So, all in all, uh, we are going from recession to sluggish growth, uh, second derivative I've, uh, I've mentioned. Uh, the cyclical uh, improvement, uh, but uh, there are still some structural issues uh, moving uh, forward. There are deflationary forces at work in the Eurozone, as they've got to be uh, uh, monitored. This is why the ECB will remain on an accommodative uh, mode. Uh, I think that three of, out of the four macro actors have basically rushed to the door to deleverage at the same time uh, in Europe. Households, banks, states. Only corporates are flooded with, uh, with cash. They are in very sound position. They are more global than, strictly speaking, Europeans. 60% uh, of their uh, uh, business is uh, global uh, rather than uh, uh, European. And this is important in terms of uh, European equities. Uh, when you are buying a European equity, Germany, France, or whatever, actually you are being a global stock. Coming at a discount. This is why there is a positive case to be made uh, for European equities due to the uh, events we, uh, we all knew. Uh, so the end of the recession, low levels of rates and yields, low stress, uh, there is uh, attractiveness across uh, the uh, Eurozone. Uh, Central scenario, I've already uh, gone to, to uh, the, the big uh, conclusions in the US, uh, ongoing recovery, fragile, but ongoing, and the Fed will, uh, I would say, make sure that the recovery is for real before moving uh, into, uh, I would say, uh, so-called normalization, but I don't buy the concept of uh, normalization. I think we are changing uh, the regime of uh, monetary policy. The Eurozone, the recovery uh, will be slow, actually, uh, moving forward. The UK, somewhere between the US and the Eurozone. And Japan, sure, is still out on the, uh, on the investment summer. Uh, I've mentioned the, uh, one of the biggest, biggest teams, things, uh, US governance in deficit. This is the title of the, of the slide, tail risk and common sense. Uh, the basic message that there is a tail risk attached 
to uh, the, the dollar denominated uh, debt, uh, this debt should be incorporated in the investment strategy, specifically when the uh, investor is uh, overflowed, uh, who is uh, over invested in the uh, in the asset class, and this is uh, simple common sense to uh, diversify out of the uh, US when uh, when extremely uh, exposed. Uh, you know the story. Uh, this is on this slide. What would happen uh, in case of a default? Uh, let's say just missing a coupon or technical default. The answer is very simple: bang. It would be a nightmare across uh, across the globe, uh, and specifically uh, at the time when uh, any negative news is not at all priced in the minds in the markets. Uh, it's no one. Uh, to, uh, this is a recurring problem. Investor cannot tell, cannot say that the uh, oh, it's over. It was a one-off uh, problem. No. It will come back and we've got the date on the agenda. So they cannot complain in the case of... So, uh, so there is a need to rethink the allocation into this uh, fear. You know, markets are about fear, secondary relatives, you know, uh, you know for sure. So we've got to, uh, to play with this uh, fear of uh, something nasty eventually coming from a flow uh, covenant uh, on this front. Uh, two, uh, the theoretical concept of a risk-free asset has been weakened. Generally speaking, as a, as a concept, it's one of the lessons of the crisis. Uh, it's not easy to find uh, or to define what a risk-free asset is, actually. Uh, even talking uh, about uh, governmental uh, bonds uh, in the world. The funny thing about this crisis is that one of, the, one of the consequences of the crisis was to concentrate even more the global portfolios in the most indebted countries uh, of the global uh, economy. We know the results, the status of the dollar, etc. But this is the reality of the, uh, of the portfolios uh, for today, uh, actually. Um, so diversifying assets and collateralization. Europe may prove a source of diversification, but not only Europe. There are opportunities across the uh, so-called emerging uh, economies. Uh, and protecting against a tail risk is uh, fairly uh, phenomenal. Emerging markets, I think it's important for investors today to remap the universe, as I have already uh, mentioned. Don't take emerging economies or emerging market as a unique concept. Actually, I don't buy this, uh, this, uh, this concept. Uh, if you break appropriately uh, the various pieces of the so-called emerging uh, sphere, you will find that uh, there are some features closer to uh, some developed countries than others than to other uh, emerging uh, economies. Um, so the uh, fear of tapering triggered uh, actually uh, the um, the awareness uh, about the uh, deterioration in specific factors. So you've got to. Uh, go through the remapping process, fragility capital flows, portfolio flows, FDR, a need for financing. Difference between Turkey, South Africa, current account deficits uh, with, uh, with uh, facing problems in terms of financing and uh, uh, many Asian countries, for example. Two external balances, this is the same. And I've uh, indicated the, uh, the uh, I would say, the culprits uh, here today. Uh, gross prospects. Asia is okay, uh, the rest of the emerging market is struggling uh, a bit, uh, and the structure of growth is important. Is it internal demand oriented, export driven? Is it, uh, is it related to, uh, to the commodity cycle? Uh, Force fragility, the business model may improve in transition in some countries. China is one example, from export led to internal demand led uh, countries. Fragility number five, excessive credit. In some countries, 
despite the fact that, generally speaking, emerging economies are not indebted, uh, public or, or private, some cases are um, uh, compelling. Uh, I would say I've mentioned some, uh, some of the names where we've seen uh, credit uh, going through the roof in the last uh, five to uh, seven years. Um, for GT6 uh, commodities, uh, in some cases, I don't know, won't go into the details, but uh, it makes a difference uh, being an importer, being an exporter, uh, so, the, so dependency uh, towards, uh, to the commodity cycle makes a difference. Questions, if there are risk of an even greater crisis, uh, yes, eventually, uh, we are still not yet out of the woods. Are we in 99? <coughs> we are not in 99, because generally speaking, fundamentals are not comparable. They are, uh, uh, improved uh, quite a lot, but uh, on average. So it makes uh, it, it's important to uh, go to the specific uh, risk. Uh, did emerging markets regain attractiveness? Yes and no. Uh, uh, actually, uh, and you've got to stay uh, highly uh, selective. Uh, probably the, there, is, there are still some correction to, uh, to come in the most, uh, I would say, uh, tricky uh, situations. But at the same time, due to contagion, other markets are offering uh, opportunities. Are the good times over for uh, the emerging? No. The theme is still uh, alive and kicking from a fundamental standpoint. But we've got to acknowledge that the context, the dollar long rates, relative fundamentals, etc., has changed, actually. Uh, should we be patient? Yes. As an investor, I think uh, you should remain exposed to the emerging uh, economy, some of them at least, but uh, probably in terms of timing, uh, there is room uh, to, uh, to wait a bit, actually. Uh, should we be more selective? Yes, for sure. Uh, more, than, uh, more than ever, remapping the uh, emerging uh, universe is, uh, is crucial. Should we favor equity or debt? Uh, actually, on the debt side, uh, local uh, is should be favored uh, in a, a view. Uh, emerging equities are likely to be driven by uh, global markets more than emerging debt would be uh, to be driven by developed countries' sovereign debt. I would say this is one uh, one point. But you've got to have in mind that uh, current risks in emerging economies are related to co-governments more than to companies. Meaning that uh, you, we would favor companies of our governments while still being uh, selective. Actually. And keep an eye on liquidity management and FX management across uh, the uh, emerging sphere. The slides uh, just sum up the uh, GDP growth forecast. I won't go into the details, uh, shifting actually uh, to our allocation. We favor on the equity side the euro area, for the reason I've mentioned. Japan, number two, we are neutral US. Neutral emerging markets as a whole, uh, with a preference uh, in Northern Asia uh, and underweight Pacific in Japan. Uh, today, but this will evolve. One way to uh, illustrate is this one, actually. This uh, diagram shows uh, relative earning per share momentum, horizontal axis, and uh, market trend. This is a momentum type of uh, measure, uh, actually. Uh, if you are in the uh, upper left <coughs> side, you are here, actually, attractive in terms of valuation, I would say. Uh, so EPS momentum building, uh, and this is probably the, the, the most promising area in terms of uh, value uh, picking. Uh, upper right end of the diagram, US, Japan, Germany, maturing to an extent, the cycle equity uh, market cycle is uh, maturing. Uh, left, bottom left end of the, uh, of the diagram, you are basically a, a situation in which you are APS momentum de uh, decelerating at a time when valuations are not, generally speaking, extremely attractive. This is given by the size of the bubble. The biggest 
the sites uh, actually um, the smaller the bubble the more promising the market the bigger the bubble uh, the most of the uh, the, the, the market and there is a, a rotation uh, actually uh, uh, across the, uh, the diagram Investment strategies of Amundi, uh, this is the next one. Uh, actually, we are on uh, risky assets because we, still, we are still in the sweet spot, thanks to central banks being selective, uh, for sure, but long credit, uh, corporate credit, uh, long equities with some preferences, uh, actually long the dollar uh, versus uh, virtually uh, everything, uh, specifically uh, the yen, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the euro, and to a certain extent, commodity uh, currencies. We are short duration in the core bond markets, governmental, uh, and in the peripheral, we are, uh, we are constructive on Italian bonds, more than uh, Spanish. Uh, long term investors bridging the funding gap. Uh, this is my last uh, point. Uh, so the market that you uh, have gone through is a way to look at asset allocation. Funding gap is another way, actually. As I mentioned in the introduction, the gap has never been so important. There is a strong interest for long-term investments and in the multiplicity of domains. Agri-food, water, commodities, new technologies, infrastructure. Uh, on top of this, long-term investors are considering more and more the integration of ESG criteria or SRI types of uh, policies uh, moving forward. For example, uh, I've got in mind a uh, long-term investor in sovereign, sovereign space trying to exploit the mispricing of carbon price, taking a long-term view, building an equity portfolio, getting rid of uh, the carbon-sensitive stocks and moving forward. Actually, this is one, uh, one example. Multiplicity of strategies uh, and some changes in the business models. So uh, this is a diverse uh, world. You've got family offices, foundations, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and, uh, uh, and across the sovereign wealth funds community, there are various uh, <coughs> positions. Uh, don't consider as SWS as a, as a block, as a, as a unique uh, concept. They form a community, uh, but uh, you've got multi-generational funds where long-term projects are eligible, development funds, uh, but generally focused on domestic or regional markets. Pension reserve funds, long-term products are okay, but depending on the structure of their liabilities. Stabilization funds, long-term products, yes, uh, no, they are not eligible, sorry. Stabilization funds, no long-term products due to their liquidity constraints. <coughs> uh, and state-owned enterprises, uh, it's part of an industrial logic or strategy. Those, this uh, segmentation is important. It shows you how uh, specific is the positioning of every actor, uh, whether based in the Middle East, uh, in Europe, uh, in, uh, in, in Asia, Northern, Southern Asia, actually. And this translates into different objectives and therefore different types of strategy, liquidity versus liquidity, uh, long-term eligible, not eligible. Uh, you know, uh, a link or not a link with a uh, liability uh, structure. Uh, so two big questions that all face, actually, is how to correctly assess risks and performance. So uh, risks and performance, the question is twofold. Uh, the question of valuation of listed versus unlisted, frequency of valuation, correlation with the market, Valuation of liquidity risks and the risk of a change in the structure of uh, investor uh, liabilities. This valuation uh, topic. The methodology of valuation itself IRR, cash on cash, public market equivalent, mark to market, historical value accounting. This uh, makes this a universe of SWF uh, heterogeneous from this uh, standpoint. Uh, and they are all working on those issues. The second big block of uh, challenges is the, mis the eventual misfit between investments and fund targets. And they are all working on the, uh, it's not exhaustive, on, on, on the following uh, aspects. 
appropriate governance structure, making sure to align the objectives of the fund, the, uh, in the nature of the investment strategies, the board, the tenure, tenure of the board, the long term the long term structure of the component of the structure of the board, the investment horizon. It's easy to say uh, to being a long term investor, you know, uh, there are many long term investors in the world. In the real life, uh, they are uh, they are less than we uh, than we think. Uh, and they've got to uh, actually to get rid from the uh, short term pressures, the calendar year uh, pressures and move into a real Long term approach, uh, aligning uh, their governance, national accountability, uh, justification for foreign investment versus domestic investment, uh, foreign exchange risk and edging, liquidity constraints on illiquidity uh, portfolios, uh, hegemonic risk. See uh, the debates about uh, China worldwide, about Qatar uh, in France, uh, this kind of uh, debate. Uh, there are uh, national uh, debates uh, across uh, the uh, community, uh, reputational risk and then risk. Uh, this one is important. Exploring how to benefit from the specific. I've, uh, I've put on, the, on this slide uh, various themes at work in the real life uh, corresponding to uh, actual uh, strategies of uh, SDBS today. There are advantages for the client, dedicated, uh, and challenges faced uh, by the long term investor. Well, first one I've already mentioned is basically addressing the, the fact that uh, market cap weighted index strategies are flawed, actually, from a risk standpoint. Actually, uh, the, when you are managing passively a portfolio, don't think uh, it's uh, risk neutral. It's not risk neutral. So, this, uh, so they've, decided, they've moved into the various strategies. You can reduce the risk of your portfolio. This is the low volatility type of approach, mean variance. You basically select stocks on the basis of their volatility. You can equal the risk. You put the, the idea that uh, of an equal contribution uh, in terms of risk of every component of the portfolio. You can optimize the diversification across stocks uh, in the portfolio. This kind of things. Better performance in many market conditions. This is the advantage, and specifically in bumpy uh, market environments. If you've got a trend like that in the equity market, market cap weighting index will help perform. And if you think that uh, you will go through, uh, you know, uh, into a bumpy road, it's better. Challenges. Uh, you need a clear understanding of the portfolio construction. Counter-cyclical investment. This is the second one. The nature of uh, Long-term investments need long-term investors. In order to justify being a long-term investor, you've got actually, actually to believe in the fact that at the end of the day, there is, there is value in the market, there, is, there are mispricings, uh, that those mispricings will be corrected, that you can take a contrary view, and that you, uh, we, we, you, you basically will mean or revert to the equilibrium level, or the mispricing will disappear uh, over time, actually. And this is a matter of belief and policy from a, a, a real uh, long-term investors. And it makes them different from the temptations we are seeing in the investment community, basically doubts about uh, the possibility to extract value uh, disappointing results from uh, asset managers in extracting value, uh, too many, too much volatility. Uh, even if I'm right on the fundamental side, I would be caught in the volatility of the of, of the market, animal spirit, uh, this kind of things. Though those guys uh, in the SWS communities are, are basically standing for this kind of uh, belief in value. So they are counter by lows and high, they are liquidity providers. Uh, the advantage is that they can extract higher returns because they have got a long term investment, mispricing or carbon, uh, inefficiencies in the Japanese equity market. This is an, another example uh, due to the fact that after 15 years of deflation, 
uh, research houses stopped working uh, and researching the market, so there are inefficiencies uh, across, uh, across the market, etc. You got to have the governance right in order to keep the positions under pressure. Taking a, a 10 year, 15 year view, uh, it's, a, it's a long way, actually. And being a chief investment officer, uh, taking this kind of uh, uh, position. You've got to make sure to, uh, to go through the end of uh, the calendar year uh, and move forward, actually. Infrastructure, this is a big area uh, of focus. Airports, uh, specifically roads. Uh, this is seen as an inflation, rate, uh, inflation protection, source of diversification. And uh, the question is basically, there, there is big demand. The question is to find profitable opportunities. This is important as a message. People think that there are many uh, opportunities in the infrastructure space everywhere. This is wrong, actually. The question is not demand. It's profitable opportunities. This is one aspect. And the second uh, problem or challenge is basically to uh, go through the construction risk phase, the greenfield phase, where you need some kind of uh, risk guarantee or enhancement of the project. This is why today, for example, the World Bank is launching a, a, an initiative of creating a vehicle, issuing bonds with the, uh, the guarantee of the World Bank that will be invested in infrastructure products and they will bring long-term investors to the, to, to the bonds directly or directly to the infrastructure project. This is a project we've, we've been involved in. Uh, it's been uh, launched uh, three weeks ago in Washington during the IMF uh, meetings, uh, including uh, actors uh, of the region, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, for uh, RMB, or uh, currency, the, 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 the two big areas of diversification in terms of currency <coughs> is RMB, potential of operation of the, uh, of the currency, for example, uh, as a currency, but also in terms of uh, assets, uh, bonds, for example, assuming that you've got the size, which is a uh, if you are a big sovereign wealth fund do, willing to do uh, RMB sports, for example, uh, you need size, actually. Uh, and, and the market is to an extent uh, tied today. Uh, other areas is commodity currencies, because they are inflation uh, protectors. Um, Mispriced assets about the long run, carbon, water, and others, actually. Uh, it's not about, uh, I would say, the pure uh, societal or ethical theme of sustainability. It matters. It's about also profitability, exploiting the mispricing of some, uh, of some prices. And it will work, uh, actually. Uh, the carbon price is a, is a typical, typical example of, uh, of uh, mispricing. Uh, and last but not least, a big move within the central banking uh, space. We are seeing more and more central banks diversifying into equities, into commodities, into real assets, and specifically equities. But they want to decorrelate the risks attached to their FX uh, reserves management from the impact of their monetary policy on their balance sheet. So uh, across the region, specifically in Asia, we've seen uh, central banks moving into the equity space, into the uh, balanced type of uh, strategies, uh, spaces, to the commodities uh, space, in order to diversify uh, the, the, the reserves. There are challenges. For example, if you uh, diversify into a, a equity space as a central bank, you've got the question immediately, uh, should I hold uh, financial stocks? Because it brings moral as a, as a challenge. You cannot be uh, conflicted being a uh, central bank and don't send at the same time being invested in uh, financial stocks. So those uh, are examples, there are others, of uh, real-life uh, strategies at work. We start where I started, uh, so, so, and this we we'll stop where I started actually. Uh, so the long-term investing uh, in the Changing World uh, Conference, uh, 5, 6 uh, December of, uh, of this year, uh, so in months time, Concert, uh, bringing together Amundi, the SMU, Dauphine University, the Columbia University Research Initiative. Uh, and the program uh, here basically will go through uh, 
had one big session about the impact of foreign capital on local firms in emerging markets with uh, various uh, uh, well-known speakers uh, on the topic, um, for example, the World Bank, uh, uh, a second big session on strategic allocation of uh, sovereign uh, Western uh, entities uh, with IMF uh, contributors, community speakers, uh, uh, followed by a panel uh, and closing speech. Basically, uh, uh, the following day, so day two, uh, so Robert Schiller will, uh, will uh, give a keynote uh, address, Finance and the Good Society, the title of uh, this uh, last book. Uh, and session number three will deal with the inflation product of the securities um, with uh, people from the uh, Singapore Management University and, uh, and uh, consultants uh, for the uh, GAC uh, in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, so if, 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 as you can see, uh, a good mixture of uh, applied academics, speakers, purely academics, practitioners uh, on the sovereign wealth fund side, uh, asset managers, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, keynote addresses from uh, Robert or uh, Sargent. Uh, if uh, animal spirits exist, what should I do as, a, as an investor, as a specifically a long-term investor? Should I uh, stop? basically uh, taking a long-term view because at the end of the day animal spirits will win uh, or uh, should I do exactly uh, the opposite and, and take a little longer uh, time framework and session number four sharing new experiences in governing sovereign wealth funds uh, actually uh, people coming from Israel and Estima uh, this is the governance issue which is critical in, uh, in this uh, kind of investment uh, space, and in, <coughs> in any investment space, what is critical is to have a clear uh, and cut alignment of the uh, covenants uh, time framework, definitions of the investment areas, uh, actually, and the strategies you intend to follow. Thank you for your attention. Okay, that's already introduced me, so I, have, I do have to uh, name myself and uh, introduce my, my background. Um, I have two questions. Um, I heard from the investment community recently saying in the short run, they very favor our advanced economies because, uh, because of the liquidity <coughs> support and also the recovery in the US and uh, the out of recession in the US. But in the medium to long term, their view still on the, particularly on the emerging markets in this region. So what's your view in the medium to long term, or in particular to the Asian uh, emerging markets? Do you still think they are you know, attractive, favorable for long term investments? Uh, my second question is about um, uh, the um, Sort of uh, uh, your funding gap. This is you think the long-term investors can can do to do this. But for the investment gap, I guess the uh, the government in uh, I mean the funding gaps in in Asia, in particular in the infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, proposals by the regional governments saying they use their uh, fiscal reserves. To, uh, to invest in the infrastructure project. I recently uh, read a news uh, on papers that uh, you know, uh, the, the president of China, uh, Chairman Xi, uh, he say promoting uh, something like an infrastructure investment bank in the region to boost the uh, infrastructure. What's your views on uh, the long-term investor can also uh, right on this kind of uh, opportunities. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Your two questions are connected actually. But on the first one, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, 
aspects are not good and will remain uh, good uh, moving, uh, moving, uh, moving forward. Doesn't mean that we are we don't have uh, challenges uh, moving forward. One, uh, when you started saying that you, we are seeing a move towards uh, developed economies uh, across. Seen from my window, uh, I think uh, the the exposure of this uh, investment community to emerging economies, generally speaking, is, is pretty high. So, uh, so we are seeing from a tactical standpoint a rising interest from, from some developed uh, areas, starting from very underweight exposure in some cases. Uh, this is one aspect, I would say the tactical uh, one. <coughs> there is two, uh, reason number two is uh, the willingness to diversify actually uh, across uh, the developed world, the emerging world. And reason number three is probably the most important. And this is where lies the, the challenge actually. Uh, typical feature of uh, some emerging uh, like Asia actually is the fact that uh, uh, they are reaching a point in their uh, cycle where they are generating surpluses uh, across, across the region. The fact that uh, the uh, local markets are not uh, often or sometimes deep enough uh, in actually to absorb this uh, excess of uh, surpluses drives the uh, necessity for some actors to uh, grow the overseas component in terms of uh, investment. So we need that. Uh, we need this case in some uh, segments of the emerging debt. So uh, the long-term investors like the ones I've, uh, I've described, they have clearly a role to help growing the capital market base. They are not the only ones. Government initiatives are important. Uh, the channeling of uh, domestic savings across Asia into, uh, I would say, uh, funds or investment strategy is important, actually. And this brings us to the, uh, the big challenge, actually, speaking in Asia. One is to uh, grow and deepen the capital market base. It's clearly uh, uh, the, the, the first one to channel savings, resident savings, into uh, the uh, investment strategies across Asia. This will make uh, the uh, capital markets across Asia more resilient uh, in case of uh, noise coming from uh, the US or whatever, uh, etc. So this is a uh, this is a uh, this is challenge, and uh, on the infrastructure uh, infrastructure uh, side, uh, I've mentioned this initiative from the World Bank, which we are seeing uh, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, the governmental level actually they are supporting. Uh, why? Because the situation today is that we we want to grow infrastructure projects uh, in various uh, emerging markets. Not only emerging markets, but let's say, etc. The ideal situation from a theoretical standpoint is uh, in order to grow rapidly an infrastructure base, is to uh, start with a pension fund base and relatively deep, deep capital markets. I'm saying it's theoretical because, in many cases, not uh, across Asia for sure, or the rest, you are faced with a lack of, of a pension fund base in order to channel it. To the infrastructure project. So the idea is basically to plug sovereign wealth funds from uh, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, etc., into onto the uh, infrastructure projects in an uh, emerging country, dealing with the foreign exchange risk, enhancing the greenfield risk. Uh, so th this is the, the, the way we uh, we do uh, we uh, we do see the so infrastructure. Yes, that is clearly. Uh, an opportunity from, a, a, I would say, a risk return standpoint for uh, long-term investors. There is clearly a, a, um, a political drive uh, coming from some, uh, some governments across the emerging economies, and specifically Asia, but not only Asia, but in America as well, to uh, politically to provide the appropriate framework to, uh, to support this kind of things. Uh, still, as I mentioned, uh, there is more demand than uh, profitable opportunities. My name is Jake, I'm from the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm 
You mentioned that uh, corporates are rolling in cash at the moment, and it's, it's like this quite a long term thing. But I'm wondering whether this cash is now being released, or if not, what would trigger that and the effect that it would have on the market? This is a global question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, point number one, uh, I've never seen uh, the amount I'm seeing of, uh, of, uh, of cash and treasury components at the big corporates. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, aligned with the, what the textbook uh, are saying. Part of the explanation due to the crisis lies on the, uh, uh, the willingness to precautionary saving actually due to the uh, challenging environment between 09 and, uh, and 30. It's, uh, it can help explaining the uh, situation. What are, uh, the lack of investment, uh, the willingness to be, uh, uh, I would say, um, cautious. Uh, now what we are, I'm seeing is that uh, uh, things are changing. They are digging into their uh, cash components uh, in order to invest, to embark on uh, marginal acquisitions. Uh, we've seen the pace of m and uh, accelerating. This is the case in Europe, the case in the States. It's a general theme. Uh, and this is, uh, maybe normal at this point of the uh, equity cycle, uh, I would say. And there is a, an opportunity cost attached to the uh, remuneration of the cash component. So you can do it through uh, deposits, money markets, and they did it, uh, actually. So uh, they are now moving into a phase that they will try to optimize <coughs> their uh, treasury component. Hi, I'm uh, Adi Manapa from Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, I had a question on the US dollar. Uh, the US dollar has seen a bit of a resurgence recently. Do you see that as being sort of a prolonged trend, or more of a sort of temporary phase and we move on to more sort of emerging market currency strength in the long term. How do you see the dollar evolving, basically? Uh, actually, uh, I can tell you what we've got in, the, in our portfolios. We are long the dollar, uh, and long uh, dollar related emerging currencies. Uh, that's just the rest, I would say. Uh, and the priority uh, for the rest, we've got uh, the front again, uh, the euro. Uh, Euro versus uh, the rest of European currencies, uh, Western, uh, I would say. And we are long the dollar versus commodity currencies, Canada, or the Aussie, uh, actually. Uh, we still think that is the case. Uh, Positive is in the fa favor of the dollar, uh, taking a foreseeable um, future, actually, as a horizon, for one, uh, cyclical reasons. Uh, if anything, the, uh, the first uh, curve to build has already started into uh, prospects of higher interest rates will be uh, in, in the US, uh, actually, at the time when the uh, central bank in Japan will continue to drive or to try to drive uh, the yen downwards. Uh, still, same for the ECB. Not the central bank of Japan, but you should expect more on the accommodative side, including a, a new version of the LTRO, which uh, will come uh, probably. The second reason is valuation. Uh, you know, that it takes time for uh, value consideration to, uh, to, uh, to uh, translate into reality on the FX side, uh, but the euro is uh, arguably uh, overvalued. Uh, of evaluation of the, uh, the yen has still some way to do. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, be, it will be a volatile uh, journey, uh, I would say, because on the US side, we will live now, you know, we've got a date, it was, it was clear. That with this, this debt ceiling uh, shutdown uh, fear again. So uh, this may bring volatility uh, uh, <coughs> one aspect. Second aspect, the, uh, the uh, strength of the US recovery is not yet confirmed, meaning that we will see volatility coming from uh, macro data from the US. People thought in June, 
striking the out of the woods recovery in their employment, uh, etc. They will embark on the normalization, uh, starting with Kiwi, moving to interest rates, and the curves keep shifting. Uh, it was wrong, actually. Uh, it was wrong, actually. Now it's new. Uh, the extent to which uh, the US economy is on steroids. The extent to which uh, critical uh, areas like the housing sector are driven uh, uh, recovery, not only in the real economy but also through wealth effects. The QE through the MBS channel produced uh, wealth effects to the uh, to the U.S. consumer. Uh, actually, so they know how the fragile is it, it is. Since there is no risk of inflation, the West is faced with deflationary forces, not inflationary forces. In my view, they will stay uh, on, a, on the asymmetrical side of the monetary policy. They will prefer to face the risk of uh, actually uh, eventually uh, having inflation in Russia than, uh, than killing the recovery uh, at an early stage. And, uh, on top of that, we, we don't know uh, how any, <coughs> not, uh, any uh, even modest rise in interest rates will be uh, sustainable given the extent uh, to which uh, public debt is, uh, is important in some countries, uh, to the extent to which uh, the housing uh, recovery is fragile, you know, this kind of thing. So, uh, and, uh, but this is the cyclical view. Um, my structural core, actually, is that what we are seeing today is the, the end of the Volcker's uh, period starting in the early 80s with a clear uh, mandate, kill inflation, uh, drive inflation downwards, etc. Uh, and this was, generally speaking, the DNA of most Western central banks. Uh, I think this uh, period has come to an end. Uh, they have already moved into uh, another model, still to be theorized. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important. Uh, uh, where uh, we are seeing new instruments of central banking, the quantitative easing, so called exceptional or non conventional, it's part uh, of, the, of the tools. And they, uh, uh, and they, are, they are still to, uh, to, uh, to express and communicate the new parameters and indicators of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the model. Just take the Fed. Uh, Sure that the new government, the, the new uh, Fed, the new chairman, will uh, put a strong emphasis on employment <coughs> as an indicator. They, they will have to uh, drive to, to give avoidance to the market uh, in a different way compared with the past, actually. So, uh, uh, this is a challenge for them. It's why we've seen uh, some. Uh, some volatility in the ancient times. Uh, we had a guidance on leading interest rates, uh, inflation, uh, uh, M3 for the ECB, uh, etc. Uh, guidance got to be reinvented to, uh, to an extent because the objective was shifted. Uh, another example is it's obvious that uh, their, their, their reaction function as now includes now asset prices from, uh, from the crisis. This is what quantitative easing is about. But it's got to be uh, still expressed, formalized, communicated. Uh, you know, we spent uh, 30 years with central bankers telling us uh, we don't care about uh, asset prices, uh, uh, we don't have the appropriate instruments to fine tune the uh, but things have changed. So uh, the reaction function of the most Western central banks has changed. We knew it was a function of the output last. That would be the case. Unemployment, or I would say the natural unemployment uh, prices, uh, and also asset prices. When you are, when you've got a central bank in Japan buying directly into the equity market, or the Fed buying into the MBS market, you are basically uh, saying that in your reaction function, asset prices matter. 